Hi. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us here at the Story Arts Center tonight. I'm Mary Vallis. I'm a professor of journalism here at Centennial College. We're proud to host this debate tonight. This event is one of the first events to bring the candidates together in the new Ward 14. And we thank them for making themselves available and to answer questions from the public. More than 100 students from our broadcasting, public relations, and journalism programs are working on this event tonight. It's been incredible watching them seize the responsibility. I hope that if they stop you in the halls for a question or a photo, that you will give them a few moments of your time. I'd also like to acknowledge you and everyone watching online. We hope you enjoy the live stream on YouTube and Facebook and the live blog on torontoobserver.ca. Please feel free to participate uh, on Twitter by using the hashtag Ward14Debate. And now, I'm going to turn the mic over to Nate Horowitz to say a few words. Nate is the Dean of the School of Communications, Media, Arts and Design and Campus Principal of our Story Arts Centre. Thank you, Mary. I'll start off this way. Unfortunately, I have not got the good luck of living in this area. This is a wonderful area, and we just love this. this. This is the way we show our gratitude to the constituents and the voters by holding this debate. And our students are involved, organized by Mary Vallis, this whole event, and, and other faculty. We have students involved from broadcasting, journalism, public relations. We have students here from Seneca, I believe, and Ryerson covering this event. And for us, this is very important. We're the downtown campus, if you will, of Centennial College. And we're focused here on story arts, telling stories. And, this, and that's what we, we, we graduate students doing that. As a result, we're a very well-known school, both locally, nationally, internationally. Many of the people here from the media are our graduates. We're very proud of them, as we are of our students. That's what we're about at the Story Arts Center campus. We used to also be known, some of you will know this, as Degrassi High. This is the location for Degrassi High. And uh, who tonight will be Joey Jeremiah? More serious note. Just want to say that um, democracy always starts at the local level. And right here, this debate will give Ward 14 Toronto Danforth constituents and voters a chance to interact. Our amazing students and faculty are here to cover this event. And I want to really reflect on what this is about. This is about local democracy. We're down to 25 wards. The City of Toronto, this is a, a really our time to find out what the candidates want, what they offer and it's your time to hear that. And there's gonna be people who are watching this streaming, Twitter, they're gonna interact with the candidates through Twitter, and live blogs. So welcome again, and let's get on with the candidates telling their stories. Thank you. Our moderator this evening is Samira Moyedin, a journalism graduate from Centennial, who is now a producer at CBC's The Current. She recently won a gold at the New York Festival of Radio for a documentary. She's going to tell you all about it sometime. We're pleased to have her back on campus tonight. Thank you so much, Samira. Thanks, Mary, and good evening, everyone. Um, our first order of business is to acknowledge the traditional land that we're on. Centennial College is proud to be a part of a rich history of education in this province and in this city. We acknowledge that we are on the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and pay tribute to their legacy and the legacy of all First Peoples of Canada. As we strengthen ties with the communities, we serve and build the future through learning and through our graduates. Today, the traditional meeting place of Toronto is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the communities that have grown in the treaty lands of the Mississaugas. We acknowledge that we are all treaty people and accept the responsibility to honour all our relations. We have eight candidates in the room tonight. So we're going to try and keep things moving quickly. I'll go over the debate format before we begin. 
The candidates are all seated in alphabetical order. Each candidate will be given two minutes for an initial address, then we'll move to questions. All of the questions tonight were submitted in advance. The journalism students from here have been out in the community connecting resi with residents about their concerns. We've also gathered questions by email and Google. Thank you everyone for all of your input. Each candidate will be given one minute to reply to each question. There is a grade five student in the front row timing you. <laughs> she'll, raise, uh, she'll raise a red card at the 45 second mark and shake a maraca when the timer hits a minute. <laughs> Maddie, can you shake the maraca just one more time? Perfect. A candidate who is mentioned by name in another person's reply will be given a one minute rebuttal. Should they choose to use it after all the candidates have spoken, there will be only one rebuttal per candidate per question. With each question, a new candidate will have a chance to speak first. We'll go down the table in order, okay? Now we'll move to the first opening statement by candidate Landrick Bennett, Jr. Thank you. I've been living in our community with my wife, Sabrina, and our two children, Zoe and Jackson, for the past eight years. In this time, I've experienced situations we've needed, where we've needed an engaged voice at City Hall, and that is why I'm running for City Council. I love this community, and through my work with the Black Community Police Committee, the Danforth BIA, the Out of the Cold program at East uh, Minister Church, or as a co-chair for the Parent Council at Blake Street Public School, I have stepped up to ensure our community does more. As, a community, as our community continues to grow, I know big challenges will arise, and we will need leadership that has the passion, the purpose, and the perseverance to ensure we have a real voice at City Hall. I believe we need someone who will set up the first constituency office that Toronto Danforth has seen in 15 years. Not for bragging rights, but because it's the best way to hear your concerns and to make sure that we deliver on City Council. This is important because whether it's transit projects, new condo developments, or planning of our big beautiful parks, I want to make sure that we can do more together. So today I ask you to think critically of what you hear from each of us, the candidates before you today, because you get to choose. You can choose between trying the same old strategies in a city hall that Doug Ford has drastically changed, or you can try a new approach that keeps you informed and places you at the center of our local decision making. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi there, good evening everybody. My name's Chris Budo. I'm running to bring about change to City Council. Some things that we can't take for another four years are bad leadership and definitely more party politics at City Hall. We definitely cannot take more of those. The things I talk about for City Council that we need to bring changes towards are the cost of living in the City of Toronto, for young families to pensioners to everyone in between. For young families, you look at the cost of childcare and after school programs, $2,400 a month and up to three years waiting list just to get a single child in. A lot of people can't balance the books these days for pensioners. I talk about putting a freeze to property tax increases so that pensioners can get back to earning, uh, to, to living on a livable wage, buying groceries and medicine in the same week finally. For uh, daycares and after school programs, I talk about cutting down on the bureaucracy and red tape that surrounds the industry to open up more daycares and childcare centers, to cut down on the wait times and the costs that a lot of young families are facing today. I talk about transportation and how we can expedite transportation in our city. A lot of people are looking towards more future projects and what we need to do is get politics out of transit plans. I talk about how we can free congestion in our city. I also talk about how we can reduce crime and violence in our city, which we need to place a high value on. That's why on October 22nd, you will have a clear decision. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dixon Chan, and I'm a resident and a candidate for Ward 14. 
Tonight you'll hear a lot about change in this ward. Sitting amongst us are two incumbents who's had many years at City Hall. They'll come out and say all the things that they've done over the years. But that experience does not override my lifetime experience that I can bring to the job. The big questions we need to ask our incumbents are, did they do enough for us and do we want more of the same? Ever since I announced my candidacy in early May, I've knocked on thousands of doors and engaged even more online. The overwhelming response is that we need change and we want change. But how do you decide on that change? The Toronto Library has been very good about launching a website called Know Your Vote. And in that site, we get to compare all, uh, all these candidates and what they believe in. And that is a powerful tool. It informs the voters and gives them true choice about who they want for that change. On a personal note, I'm a widower and a single father. My whole life has been dedicated to my work and to my family. That's 26 years of running a store, managing staff, serving customers, and getting things done. As a, as a father, it's as simple as walking your kid to school and coaching her, 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 her running club. These are unique skills that I bring to City Hall. Thank you. Hello, my name is Marisol Andrea. I would like to first thank Centennial College for organizing these inclusive events. I am all about inclusivity. I have been living in this world for 20 years. I immigrated from Lima, Peru 28 years ago, escaping from poverty and violence. I am a strong believer in building opportunities for our future generation, in particular for those at risk. I have been married for 19 years. I have two teenage daughters, two turtles, and a friendly dog. <laughs> Last year, while working full time at the University of Toronto, I completed a doctoral degree in leadership and education. I am also an active um, visual artist and an author. I have written, published uh, a children's books. I am in the works of working on a book on innovation. Today I say to you, there are so many challenges facing this community. There are serious, there are many, and they are all around us. I am tired of waiting. I am tired of waiting for my politicians to do something for us to improve our community, to serve the community. Uh, so that's why I decided to step up. Crime is skyrocketing. It's not going anywhere. Innocent life has been lost. Our roads and infrastructures need care. They are dilapidating. Garbage is everywhere. There is a lack of affordable housing. That's the most popular topic that we're going to hear tonight. And I, I have become a concerned citizen of all the issues that are all in front of us, and nobody's really taking care of them. I don't want to be a politician that is in a party cutting a cake. I want to be your politician that solves the problems in this city. So my, my, my main goal is to, issue, uh, to address crime, uh, to help the environment, to work with grassroots uh, uh, organizations, and most importantly, to restore confidence in politics of our elected officials. Thank you. Good, e Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Paula Fletcher, and I'm running for re-election here in the new Ward 14. And I just want to thank everybody for taking the time tonight to come out to this debate. It's a very good one, and there's only two. So thank you for taking the time to the residents and for being concerned about your politics in this ward. Um, I also just want to thank Centennial College and all the students for putting this on. And as well, I just want to say it's great to meet all the other candidates because we really haven't met one another. Of course, Mary and I know one another, and Dixon attended many city council meetings when he decided to run and got to know him there. So it'll be good to hear from everybody tonight. This is a very difficult election. We've been through a uh, 47 election, a 25 election, a 47 election, and now we're in a 25 election because of the terrible meddling by the provincial government in a system that the city council and the OMB and the superior court had set up after four years of consultation. So it's a very hard election for many people and I'm meeting voters that are very upset that they're having to make the choices that they're having to make. I'm also very concerned that uh, 
Premier Ford is not finished yet with the City of Toronto. He's indicated he wants to take over the TTC, to take transit away from the City of Toronto, and worst case scenario would be to privatize our transit, great TTC transit system. There's many big issues we're going to have tonight. We're going to have a great debate about transit, about housing, and many other things. Um, but I really know that everyone here has put their name forward, is very devoted to this community, has a lot of great ideas, so I'm very pleased to be here tonight with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Mary Fragadakis. I'm the City Councilor for the current Ward uh, 29 and running for re-election in the new Ward 14. And I'd briefly like to outline the key three themes that are woven through many of the issues that I believe we're going to be discussing tonight. Uh, you can think of them as the basic ABCs of our political landscape. A is for affordability. Many people are being squeezed out of Toronto by the cost of things like child care and housing. We desperately need to invest more in both. Uh, we also need to include in this discussion and the scourge of poverty that still haunts our city. C is for climate change. Climate change is real and is already wreaking havoc on the lives of many people. We must tackle this issue head on. I firmly believe that we cannot leave future generations with an insurmountable environmental debt. As a quick aside, uh, let me tell you about a little uh, about a policy change that I led uh, to address both of these. As a member of the TTC board, I put uh, the new two-hour transfer policy on the board's agenda and shepherded it through implementation. How important is that policy change, you might ask? Well, one uh, U of T engineering grad student uh, did a review of the economic, environmental and social benefits of 100 infrastructure and policy options and concluded that the time-based transfer option was by far the best. So A is for affordability and C is for climate change. B is for bombastic bullies like Donald Trump. Trump won by offering simplistic divisive ideas. Good public policy must come from evidence-based decision making. Sloganeering, fake news and divisive politics undermine that and we need to have an honest and open public discussion that is inclusive and grounded in well-vetted openly shared data. This is how we get all the great minds and ideas in our city working together to shape a better future for all and I'm running for re-election based on my track record for doing just that. On uh, that note I want to conclude by thanking the organizers of this event and everyone who's come out tonight and all the candidates who are participating. This is what democracy looked like. Thank you. As you heard, Ryan Lindsay, ryanlindsay.ca. I love our vibrant community here in Toronto Danforth, yet many of us struggle with the cost of living. Mortgages and rents are skyrocketing, and so is the time it takes us to get around this city. City Council's mismanagement has driven us into massive deficit, and their solutions are to cut, cut, cut. Cut transit, cut prevention, crime prevention, community development programs. A local councillor has voted to raise property taxes by twice the rate of inflation every year at a time when families are struggling to pay the bills. And they say they will re resist Doug Ford, but now we have two councillors that have to run against each other. If we keep voting for the same councillors, we'll face these same problems year after year. We need councillors who prioritize affordability for everyone through better fiscal management. I grew up in a working class family and learned the value of financial responsibility. I have over 15 years experience building health and education systems by bringing together diverse groups of people to fix budgets and get results for local communities. At City Hall, I will champion these ideas and the political strategies we need to outfox Doug Ford and the regressive councillors to make housing and property taxes affordable build the relief line, create jobs and daycare spaces, and curtail poverty, gangs, and climate change. I will improve communication with residents by hiring a technically savvy, knowledgeable team that is responsive, and together with you, we will fight for solutions that save us time and money and strengthen our community. And if there's only one takeaway for tonight, I've already given it to you, ryanlindsay.ca. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, good evening everybody. <clears throat> I'd like to start off by thanking the community of Toronto Danforth, Ward 14, as well as Centennial College for putting on this event. So I'm Chris Marinagas, and I'm here tonight because I would like to become the new voice of the Ward 14 
and the new voice at City Hall. I was born and raised in East York, just down the street at the Toronto East General Hospital, now known as Michael Garan Hospital. And I was actually raised on Dilworth Crescent, just a block away from where we sit right now. I spent my youth playing soccer and baseball in this very field, uh, Centennial College, or formerly known as Toronto Teachers College. And if you ask anybody in the community about Chris Maranakis, I'm sure it would take one or two degrees before we found a connection. So that's the reason why I'm running here. I just, it's part of me. The reason I'm here is because I'm here to serve, I, lo I love the city of Toronto, and I love our community, and I want to serve the people of Toronto, and this community, of course. I want to make sure that Toronto Danforth progresses in, into an even better community where we live, work, and play, and where future generations can flourish. I would like for all our children, mine included, to experience a beautiful city where they can start their own families without fear, with manageable traffic, with excellent transit and to do this within an affordable and caring community. To do this, we need to make crucial decisions regarding traffic, transit, safety and affordability. Excuse me, where is my chair? Alexander Pena, where is my chair? Excuse me, did you register for the event? Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. Can I continue? I would, I would, I would like to thank, I'm sorry? To do this, we need to make crucial decisions regarding traffic, transit, safety, and affordability. And those decisions need to be made today in order to properly plan and implement them. I'm not a politician, I'm actually an engineer. However, I, know I possess the vision, the knowledge, the problem-solving skills, and the perseverance to help make sure that the right decisions are made for our community. I would like to please ask you for your consideration before heading to vote for your city councillor. I will be here for you. Please contact me with any of your concerns. Thank you. Thank you to all the candidates. Uh, a lot of different approaches, a diversity of concerns. Um, we're going to now move to our first question. With the changes. Sorry, what about the other candidate? I'm sorry? Mr. I don't see him. He was escorted out. He's not in the room. I don't know what to do. So I think. Shall we move ahead until he comes back in? Thank you. With the changes to ward structure, the size of Ward 14 has gotten a lot bigger. How will you ensure that voices of everyone in vo Ward 14 are heard, particularly those in marginalized communities? Chris Budo, you'll go first. Absolutely. So one thing that I found actually so far, I've done close to 3,000 kilometers of walking throughout the campaign, and I've knocked on many, many doors. The biggest thing that you have to keep in mind, the best way to get information from constituents and the residents is to always knock on doors. We also have to be utilizing 21st century media outlets, such as Facebook, Instagram, even Twitter. A lot of people get their information through these outlets these days. And uh, one thing that I found that's very interesting throughout the ward is that a lot of people actually don't know the voting record of their current city council or what they actually do for them. They just know some big level things, how they vote on some big issues, but not what they do in the nitty gritty. For me, I'd actually like to start sending out voting records in layman's terms with my explanation behind every single voting record and budgets out to the people so they can start understanding and get more involved. Handing out tools is a very good way to start. Thank you. When, when I heard about the change in ward sizes and the size of the ward and how many people we had to represent, the immediate concern was how do we represent? Every councillor has, has four to five staff and a budget and an office budget. I, I, I will maximize that budget. It, it's no different than when I am working. If there is a call, it has to be replied. 
if there is a concern in an email, it has to be replied. The statute of limitations in work is one day, maybe two. There's no excuse for weeks and weeks without a reply. Some councillors and some candidates here are talking about a constituency office. As a business owner, I know how much that costs. That's $30,000 a year. That's money that will take away from response time. So we have to work harder by hiring more. Thank you. I would like to add, those are good points. I would like to add that we need to community engagement. I plan to meet with my community uh, regularly, like we pick a block or two. Uh, we meet and we discuss their issues. And that's one way uh, to address this uh, large word. And uh, besides door knocking and, and meetings, um, that's, I think, the best we can do. Uh, because not everyone is uh, computer savvy. That's a given. We, we will do that. I will do that as well. But I think what I found the most effective was door knocking and saying hello once in a while to the community. Yeah. Uh, thank you. These are very, very busy wards compared to other places. There's permit parking, there's a lot of housing, people have needs trying to get transfers through TCHC. Uh, it is just nonstop busy and I think it's going to be very uh, challenging to engage everyone or to meet the needs of every constituent in the new ward, which is why I think it's unfortunate we moved to 25 wards. But bringing people together block by block around planning, around traffic, those are things that I do all of the time and will continue to do that throughout the new ward. And one of the things I think it's a challenge for us is what the, the seeds of hate that are sown in this ward, and I'd like to come back to that later. We can't have hate, we can't have Islamophobia, we can't have homophobia in our wards and anti-Semitism. I'm very worried about these seeds of hate, and we need to bring all these communities together in our ward. Yeah, the, uh, the, the population is going to jump at least twice what it, uh, the two words combined already is, so it's going to bring it about to 110,000 people. I actually have a constituency office in, in East York, and I have for the last eight years, um, and that really helps people here in the East End to um, be able to come and, and meet with me and my staff to, to talk about the issues that are, are troubling them um, instead of having to come downtown, so I would continue that, but, uh, um, you know, I think that... Uh, at least Paula and I both have had uh, working groups around various issues and we will, I will certainly continue to do that. Um, we can have like ward councils like they do at the Toronto District School Board um, in smaller groups to deal with some of the localized issues because the issues of East York are not going to be identical to the issues in Leslieville. They're just different communities. Yeah, we've heard some ideas about using uh, modern technology. I think that's really important in terms of um, being able to broadcast messages about important votes that are coming up, um, announcing to people where you stand on an issue. Uh, it's free to do that. Not everybody's on Facebook and Instagram, I understand, but as a way to reach a lot of people, to take a stand, to engage them, to say, we're going to vote to shift the Scarborough subway into this other project and people need to know to come out and voice their support. I would also like, I think that we can find a way to turn Doug Ford's disaster into a positive. I think that it's fine to have uh, 25 wards. We need to look at um, investing in our community councils, possibly having paid part-time trustees, two or three per, um, uh, per East York downtown, Scarborough, etc and downloading some of the budget and some of the decision making to those community councils so that people feel like they're represented right, people right there in the community. They don't have Giorgio Mammoliti deciding on stop signs on their block. Um, and I would like to let people know where I stand through media. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I would uh, like to set up a, a proper and fully serviced constituency office where every and any person is free to walk in or contact us via email or telephone or whatever it may be to voice their concerns and address those concerns. Aside from that, it would be my responsibility as a representative of Ward 14 to visit every part of this community, like from one corner to the other, all these communities, to ensure that people's concerns are addressed. And you do that by going and visiting every community, FaceTime, and asking all those community members what the problems are and dealing with those problems. 
Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Oh, I'm sorry. No, we're, the way that we've set it up is to go and then come back. But if you'd like to go ahead and answer that question, go ahead. Yeah. Sure, go ahead. Give it chance. Do you want me to read it again? No, no, okay. that's okay, sorry. Um, Go for it. So I actually do believe in uh, having a constituency office. I want it to be fully staffed. I want it to be open Monday to Friday. I want to make sure that we are able to get out into the community by having pop-up uh, uh, conversations with our community. I've been visiting a lot of Toronto housing uh, throughout uh, throughout the both sides of the ward and the one thing that I'm hearing time and time again is where am I? Where am I in what is going on? People want a voice and that means you need to make sure that as this councillor, as this new councillor in this new ward that you're getting out, that you're being a part of what is going on and allowing people to be a part of what's going on. Thanks. If you'd like to uh, take a look at the screen here, the, uh, the next question will appear on the screen. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Darcy Foster. I live at Pape and Danforth. Uh, and my concern, my question for the count potential councillors is with the downtown relief line coming, Pape will be a key terminus at the uh, the downtown Pape relief Avenue line and Pape out. Avenue is crying out for redevelopment. How are you going to make My sure question to you is how are you going to make sure the well? redevelopment is so done we have some well so we have some increased density without ending up with 20 and 30 story apartment buildings. I see people like uh, so when it comes to development there you need to solve many problems first. We need better transit, we need better cycling infrastructure, we need better parking permit rules, and we need free roaming car share. The number one concern whenever we increase density from gentle density with mid-levels to high rises is parking. It, it always comes back to parking. So if we lessen the impact of car need, uh, ownership, we solve a lot of the contentious issues around development. That's it. Also, with those types of developments, uh, housing, the houses are, are in the surroundings are affected. So we got to ensure that we are not distracting the neighborhood, that we are uh, having a proper permission, that we are having uh, ways to uh, provide, uh, communicate with the community of what's happening. Because what I found out many times during my canvassing was that the community wasn't informed. And it was a surprise for them that things are happening in their surroundings without any notifications. So I would have, I would love to, in this type of projects, to have a town hall meeting and seek out uh, remediation from the community and to identify those affected before proceeding with any changes. Yes, we need better transit and we need changes and development in PAPE station. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, one of the important things to do with transit hubs, which PAPE will be, and also Gerard and Carlaw is also a transit hub for the Relief Line and also for Smart Track, is to have a planning study. And I have initiated that for Gerard and Carlaw to look at what the impact of that transit will be because people will want to be developing on these transit hubs and we should have development. What fits into the community is very important. Having a stakeholder group to be hand-in-hand uh, hand with planning to look at what it should look like and also to add traffic, a very professional traffic study because these stations already, PAPE, Broadview, the traffic and the uh, transportation, the TTC are already having trouble moving around. So just getting right to the bottom of it and getting a planning study initiated is number one. Uh, so we actually have a, a, the Danforth Avenue planning study for this section of Danforth from Coxwell to Broadview that's going to get underway in 2019. Um, we also will have a major corridor study that will be a part of that as well as I had moved in uh, probably 2016 a complete streets approach to looking at the public realm for uh, Danforth from Coxwell to Broadview um, because 
pay will become a terminus for the downtown relief line we're going to need to have all of these things firing on all cylinders I when I did the Broadview Avenue planning study um, it was looking really at the built form and transportation really wasn't at the table to talk about the very specific transportation and traffic needs um, that were really uh, a part of the discussions that we were having and that was actually a real problem so we and with the da uh, Danforth study um, we made sure that it was in the motion that those traffic and transportation studies would happen so that we could actually have a more meaningful discussion and with the stakeholder advisory groups that are, are come with those uh, particular planning studies yeah I don't disagree with anything that's been said so far we have the studies we have city plans about having more density uh, approximately six-story buildings on a lot of our thoroughfares where we're not um, taking over communities with towers um, but we are building in the density that we need to increase the housing supply which will lower housing costs built into those projects needs to be um, affordable housing needs to be things like uh, units that are larger for families um, and we need to we need to stick to those studies as well as artist lofts I'm gonna say something controversial while Doug Ford's in office the downtown relief line is not coming to Toronto um, he doesn't get a lot of votes in this part of the wor world and I don't think that he's gonna be giving us the money so I think we need to face reality I would like to uh, I have a plan called shift the Ford tax it's about 50 million dollars a year for all the money that goes to the Scarborough subway because because of the Ford tax I think we need to shift that into more local transit funding while Doug Ford is in office um, more frequency on our rapid bus routes and I think we can possibly convert one of our streetcar lines into a uh, uh, we would uh, need to start by completing the traffic and parking study. Uh, we would also need to involve the local businesses, uh, Pape Village and the Danforth BIA, to ensure that parking is uh, addressed. It's going to be one of the most major pro problems that we're going to deal with here. So we have to get the community involvement, those two establishments, Pape Village and Danforth BIA, to get on board with uh, what they would like to see as well. In terms of the development, obviously Pape, Pape Avenue is not something that you want to develop into 10 and 20 and 30 story uh, buildings. We'll find a way to, do, to create uh, multi-residential within reason, obviously. Thank you. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, we're making sure that development is not going to be evil. We want to make sure that our stakeholders, the community, are all a part of what it is that we're going to be going forward with. Yes, we don't want 20 or 30 story buildings being uh, put through uh, at PAPE, but we want to make sure that we're maximizing the density that we have there. We want to make sure that we're putting the right types of development, the right types of housing. We need to put more housing in general into our, uh, into our piece, and we are making sure that in every way, shape, and form that we are looking at transit, we are looking at traffic, we are looking at mitigating any way of keeping that from continuing to develop uh, something good in that area. I agree with what was said by most of the candidates here. What we really need to be looking into is studies of the Danforth and PAPE area because as we see south of the Danforth when a lot of private development comes in even 15 stories tall you see a lot of congestion and what we really need to see is more private developers paying into things like green space adequate infrastructure improvements and definitely local transit projects such as the PAPE relief line they need to have a vested interest in the area what we see nowadays especially south of the Danforth is a fight over parking if private development comes in we definitely need to see adequate adequate parking space put in as well thank you thank you we move on to question three this one was submitted to our Google form what specific actions will you take to create more rental housing in this ward and to ensure that residents aren't displaced as Toronto Danforth changes? Let me start with you, Marisol. Well, um, we, we need to build more housing, more affordable housing. There is no question about it. Uh, we also need to discuss with the community what sort of housing do we need to build? Is it a mid house? Is it a Toll house, what is said that it won't interfere with the daily life? Um, 
So we need to plan that out properly. We need to look at the budget. We need to really get into the numbers of who needs this housing. Because we keep, I keep hearing we need more housing, but I don't know where these people are right now. Uh, so there is no real data there of where the need is. Uh, also, I visited a lot of affordable houses, and one of the main things that I have observed is that they are not maintained. They are neglected. We keep building this housing. We, put, we place people there, and we don't do anything else about it. We need a program, to tr a transitory program, so those people are able to grow and move into the next step of their life. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Many people are getting priced out. It's very hard to get rental housing. I'm sure many of you in this audience understand that. Affordable, affordable rental is one of the most important things we can do. I'm very proud of my track record in keeping people in the community and keeping the red door on Queen Street, actually building a shelter into a condo so that all of those families will still be there. And in large developments like Riverside Square, in building and having a set aside $5 million for affordable housing to build a condo on that site, for Weston Bakery to take money from them, they have to give money to, for affordable housing on Queen Street because that's where most of the development has been in this ward. And that's the approach I take and I'd encourage anyone who gets elected to fight very hard for dollars for affordable housing and to get it built in this community. Yeah, uh, so I'm committed uh, to building purpose-built rental housing as well. I mean, we need to, to get that built. We just, or not, there, the development community isn't building that, and we need to, to, to change and make their, have incentives for that. Um, I think we also need to unlock the value in the surplus city lands to actually have a more affordable units available for people. I mean, we just have to do that. We're the city that we, that's our responsibility. I'm also committed to uh, building 100,000 affordable units in 10 years in this city. I mean, it's, it's that critical. I mean, what's the definition of affordable in this city anymore? People are having to commute an hour and a half um, to get into the, their job. Um, and that's uh, causing a lot of families to just be separated from each other. Yeah, I'm also committed to 100,000 uh, houses in the next 10 years. I think we can do it. Um, Justin Trudeau is a little bit on the ropes right now. He has a $10 billion fund for housing in Canada. Um, and he's going to look to be making some big promises in the next year. I think we need to go and get some of that funding. We are the largest city. We have the most uh, people in poverty in the country, so we need to go to him and speak that language to him that this is a place to um, set an example. We need to get tough with developers and um, raise the standards, and I know that that's difficult to do, but we can also tell them that they can build condos in Cambridge and Windsor if they don't want to build them in Toronto. They'd like making money here, and we can make trade-offs. I'd like to uh, we were talking about PAPE and Danforth. Um, I don't see why some of the other subway stations along the Danforth line, we can have some small developments to increase a bit of the supply and again, um, create jobs in the community, retail spaces, artist spaces that will bring jobs here. Um, and I think that that helps with the supply, which lowers the, lowers the, co the cost of housing. Thank you. Thank you. I will find out what type of surplus land we have available in our ward. And I would use that to uh, partner up with developers in order to build purpose-built uh, rental complexes. Uh, that's one of the easiest and solutions I think we can uh, deal with right now. We know that we don't have a, a partner in our provincial uh, uh, space right now. This is going to be a topic and a problem that Toronto is going to have to solve uh, by hopefully partnering with the federal government in looking at funding that could be put specifically to affordable housing. We have a lot of density within our, uh, our corridor here on the Danforth, on Queen, on even Girard, and we need to make sure that working with our developers that we can put forth uh, good and solid housing for as many people as possible. Rental, purpose-built, we need to have it as much as possible. 
So the question was really asking how do we reduce the cost of rental homes? So the prices right now, they're very high because we have the lack of supply in the city of Toronto. I used to work as a property manager, so I have some insight in this. What we have right now, I've talked to a lot of homeowners that actually want to develop tenancy units. And what they see is a short-term cash grab from the city, sometimes up to $60,000 for each unit that they build. That's something we can't be uh, slapping people who on, on the risk who want to build tenancy units. As also, you have private developers such as Tridel that used to make condominiums, moved to rental units, and now they're back to condominiums because they have no incentive to build rental units. We as a city have to be looking at the bigger picture instead of short-term cash grabs. We need to use our control of zoning and available land. This is an opportunity to grow Toronto that is inclusive. It's including all its residents and balancing the build for affordability, market and subsidized housing. The tools to build are there, laneway housing, inclusionary zoning, lowering development costs for mid-rise buildings on transit, multiplexing, basement apartments, incentives for rental, land leasing, taxation to minimize speculation. Housing is a fundamental need and should be the primary goal for policy and not purely for capital gain only. Thank you everyone. Move on to our next question. The Danforth shooting has left many residents of Ward 14 feeling unsafe. John Tory has suggested banning handguns. What is your position on whether handguns should be banned from Toronto? And I'd like to start with Mr. Fletcher. Thank you. And in 2008, Mayor Miller of had council of a handgun ban or a gun ban in Toronto uh, asking the federal government to do that and absolutely nothing happened because we don't have control over that and this past summer City Council again approved uh, to ask the federal government to ban handguns in the city of Toronto and the provincial government to ban ammunition sales and I feel very strongly that's a very important thing that they would do and I won't stop asking them to do that or advocating for a handgun ban. Yes, so I, I also voted uh, this past summer to uh, have asked the federal government um, for a handgun ban, um, and I will continue to advocate for that. I will also be asking um, repeatedly for uh, automatic weapons to also be banned. There's absolutely no reason why anybody in this city needs a handgun, why they need an automatic weapon. Um, you know, I can don't want to conflate the issue of the long guns. Um, that's another issue, but uh, you're not going going to eat your meat if it's full of lead. So it's absolutely ridiculous why we have handguns in this city. I don't disagree with anything. Once again, um, I, it, it's clear that this is uh, the bans are kind of a federal issue, but I think we need to apply pressure there, um, make some gains. I, I'm kind of of the approach we need to try everything. You know, we always get resistance. Well, this won't work. This won't be perfect. This won't be perfect. Let's try all of the above. People are dying. Lots of people are dying. Um, and obviously, we need to uh, work more on prevention. I think we have a situation where the police budget keeps growing exponentially. It's been on a freeze for a couple of years, but it's about to grow by leaps and bounds again. We're not necessarily measuring the effectiveness of police programs. We are seeing uh, after school programs being cut and we need to help families know that their kids are taken care of all day long and engaged in the community, sports and music that grow their confidence. Um, and we, looked, we need to look at mental health as well. I believe we need to hold the criminals accountable for their actions. Uh, we need to come crack down, like come, come down hard on, on these criminals. That's the most important thing. That's the largest deterrent, the best deterrent you can have. Uh, stats show that most crimes are committed with, by illegal guns, not necessarily a registered handguns. So I think if we find the criminal, he's found guilty, we have to hold him to account. And that'll be a deterrent for everybody else. Thank you. I agree wholeheartedly that a ban on handguns is a must and we have the federal government as a willing partner in making sure that this will be pushed through but we have to look at the larger picture as well and making sure that we're putting forth programs that are helping our youth that we have 
adequate help in mental health, that we are looking at this not just as a a one stop of putting more police out, but making sure that the community is involved in helping to curb this this horrible this horrible thing. And we want to make sure that that we want to just make sure that the community is a part of what it is that we're going forward with. I wholeheartedly agree that we need a handgun ban, but I don't think that goes far enough. What we really need to be uh, explaining are the systemic issues, and we really need to be putting a solve to them. So what we see nowadays are young men, especially from the age of 14 up to 30, that are completely disenfranchised w uh, with society, carrying out these heinous acts. And what we, re we really need to see is a better education system, and better opportunities for all, and really mental health uh, budget improvements for those who will carry out acts no matter how many opportunities or the education that they have. I am definitely against any any guns on our streets. There is no reason to own a gun in Canada. There is no reason to use a gun in Canada. We must invest in our community. We must invest in community policing. We must commit to mentoring our youth to give them opportunities to engage after school and for work. There are a lot of tools to, to improve the, the use of guns or a lack of use, to, to avoid the use of guns. And we must engage with our youth. One last thing is we need better border controls. The guns are not from legal sources. They are coming through the border. Thank you. Hello. Um, Yes, I am against uh, guns in the streets, definitely. Uh, I will uh, I support banning handgun. Yet, that's not the only, that's not an isolated uh, issue. There is more to it. We need to also address mental health. We need to build up a prevention platform. We need to take this, the youth at risk off the streets. We need to be alert of anyone ready to be committing, a, be committing a crime. So we need to enforce the police and we need to work together as a community to prevent these violent crimes. But yes, I'll support, come by. Thank you everyone. This is uh, very great, really, really moving fast here, okay. I'm sorry, I'm gonna hear from the candidates again and if there's time, we'll, we'll hear from, from people in the room. Um, we, we've taken questions from the community. If there is time, we'll take questions from the audience, but we're going to go through the candidates first. I'm going to have uh, Mary Fragadakis start with this question. Transit is a hot issue all over the city of Toronto, and there are so many plans and competing theories at play. How do you propose to get Toronto moving? Well, I'm on the TTC board. I have been for the last two years, the uh, first downtown female councillor, progressive uh, on the TTC board in, in eight years, um, and have been uh, working really hard over the last couple of years to get extra money for a number of different initiatives, one of which was, the, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, the uh, time-based transfer, the two-hour time-based transfer, and then shepherded that through from the TTC board straight through to council. Um, as well, in the budget in February, I also got about uh, four million dollars extra to deal with overcrowding on buses many of us here in this community and in other communities across the city um, watch and wait on sidewalks as bus passes by so got extra money uh, to um, to keep uh, people moving and also deal with some of the congestion that we face on some of the interchange stations like at Bloor and Young and at St. George with overcrowding on platforms um, and, and use some of that money to uh, have people work in those stations to keep the people moving yeah, I mentioned transit briefly already when we're talking about Pape Station. Um, I think one of the things that we need to do is we need to fight a little more tougher with people like Doug Ford. One thing that he's good at is definitely not ideas or explaining ideas, but public relations and forcing his ideas onto people and getting into the media. We need to be a little more, uh, we need to advocate better for our ideas. Um, we need to do that pronto to make sure that we're ahead of him talking about privatizing the TTC. Let's put a stop to that before it ever comes out of his mouth. 
Let's win that public relations war. Also, I mentioned my idea, shift the Ford tax, $50 million a year by taking Ford's tax away from the Scarborough subway and putting it into more frequent buses. Um, and we also have to pressure him. He said he's gonna pay for all the subways. Let's hold him, let's make him pay for the Scarborough subway so we can take that money away and, sp and spend it on more local projects. So we currently have a plan in place that that's going well, but it's not enough. We need to plan for new uh, relief lines, new subway lines. I believe subway lines are definitely par a big part of the answer because it will free up space above ground. We need to interconnect all parts of the city. And uh, subways will be key to that as well as some other high density transportation options. Thank you. So we're looking at all three. We're looking at subways, we're looking at streetcars, we're looking at buses. We need to make sure that those budgets are kept. We don't want our subways to be privatized. We want to make sure that that's kept within the city. That means investment. That means looking forward and making sure that we're looking at all aspects that where people are, where people are living, where people are working. We want to get people from A to B and we want to make sure that that's done in a safe and effective way. We have to make sure that all types of funding that are put through from the feds, even from the provincial government, is given and kept going continuously. So how we get Toronto moving is definitely the first step, I think, to that is really making transit less political. In my mind, and a lot of people's minds, transit is like building a road, building a bridge, or even building a sidewalk. What you have nowadays are a lot of politicians on the TTC board who are not even educated in urban development, engineering, urban geography, and they're really behind the driving wheel. What we need today are urban planners, geographers, engineers that are behind the driving wheel when it comes to transit. We also need to start setting aside a budget for future transit plans 10 years from now and even 50 years into the future. Transit planning is, is a dream. Every election, we dream of a bigger and bit better system. It's a frustration that continues. We need to stick to the smart track and build it with all six stations. We need a relief line priority, is obvious, but we need to accomplish it faster. We need, we need to push the Scarborough subway to be a three-stop, and if Doug Ford wants that to be a three-stop, we let him make it a three-stop. And lastly, Presto should be an open paid system. Visa, MasterCard, debit, no proprietary system. What I got number one riders, I use the TTC every day. And I'm tired that there is always delays or something breaks down. We need to invest on our transect. And we need to do it efficiently and effectively. We need to plan it out. We need to get to the problem and fix it. Uh, it's not about sometimes just spending a billion dollars in new more stops. It's about fixing with what we have. And that's what we need to do first. And in order to discourage too much traffic on the streets, uh, I recommend having a free riding during, let's say, 6 to 7 a.m. People can ride the transit, the TTC transit for free. So we need to take more car cars out of the street in order to, for, to be, uh, in order for every, all of us to be able to go to work on time. And uh, yeah, uh, so also, and also bike lanes, we need bike lanes, cars, and trucks have to all collaborate and work together and share the road in peace. And we need money for that. We need to invest on that. Thanks. Thank you. I, I too, uh, Ryan, feel very strongly that we have to keep the TTC public and not give it over to Metrolinx, uh, which is unelected, unaccountable organization with no minutes, no public uh, sitting watching what goes on. It's very private and also not a patchwork system where this is owned by somebody, this is owned by Metrolinx, GO runs this, the TTC runs that. We have a very good system. It's been starved for money because most of the transit dollars need to come from the provincial government. And I agree strongly that Presto was forced on the TTC by Metrolinx when an open pay system could have happened. Unfortunately, we got Presto and we're set behind now because of that, Dixon. Ms. Fragadakis, I'm going to allow a one-minute rebuttal, if you like, to Chris Budo, who said that, because you sit on the TTC board, he said people sit on the board who have no idea about urban development. If you'd like a one-minute rebuttal. Uh, urban I don't know about urban development. Well, I don't know about anything. 
Oh, so, sorry. Well, I, I'm I'm on the board of the TTC. Um, I've been an advocate for public transit for nine years. I was advocating for Transit City uh, long before I got elected, and uh, I've actually been working with uh, all the members uh, uh, that are elected to council that sit on that board, as well as the appointees from the public, um, to actually accomplish many, many things. We've actually opened a subway system while I've been on the board of the TTC. It's called York University Spadina Extension. Brian Lindsay, I'm going to have you start the next question. Cycling in parts of this ward are scary. What will you do to improve cycling safety and bike lane connectivity in this ward and beyond? Great question. Um, I bike to work uh, many days when the weather is nice. I'm not as brave beyond those months, but uh, we know that we need uh, a bike lane network, not just a, a patch of lanes here and there. Um, we can afford to do that. We have that money. Also, we need to fund the plans that we already have. So I would extend this beyond bike lanes to many plans, climate change plans with the city, flood protection plans. We build these grand plans and then don't put any money into them. And then how will we expect any results? It's the same with bike lanes. It's the same with the story about the transit. We build things on the back of napkins and then we wonder why we don't make any progress. Uh, in, in terms of bike lanes, I'd like to see uh, bike lanes on the Danforth. I'd like to find a way for us to get some parking off the Danforth to make sure that the businesses aren't going to suffer when we do that. Um, I think we have the space, but I'd like to find a way, something that works for all of the stakeholders there. In terms of cycling, I'd like to uh, utilize hydro corridors and side streets as uh, alternate routes for bikes, designated routes. I think it would be safer for cyclists. That doesn't mean that we're not going to use any main uh, arterial roads for cycling, but uh, for the most part, hydro corridors, hydro corridors are underutilized, and they're, they're vast. They can connect all areas of Toronto together, so I think that's something that we need to look at. Uh, how many of you have tried to actually get across our ward from east to west? Other than the Lakeshore bike lane, sorry, the Lakeshore uh, cycle track, we have not actually built a grid. We need to be able to put bike lanes in the places that are necessary. This isn't to say that we need bike lanes everywhere. We don't want them on every single street, but there are perfectly uh, situated corridors where we have uh, ample space and we have bike lanes already that are ready to be connected. We've had almost 15 years where we haven't had protected bike lanes. That needs to be a priority. We need to make sure that the bike lanes that we're putting forth are protected, that they are connected, that we have them from east to west, and that we can get ourselves around as best as possible. So when we talk about the issue of cycling, especially in the city of Toronto, in the East End we do have a problem where cycling is very dangerous and what we do see under the two current councillors that we have in this area is a policy of just painted white lines. We don't see enough total separate entities of bike lanes going in and we're not talking about putting total separate entity of bike lanes everywhere but we definitely need to start building the total separate entity, getting the connectivity up and getting people moving around feeling much, much safer. Everybody talks about cycling and protected lanes, but the definition of a protected lane is buffers and plastic bollards. We need a curbside protected lane. The only way to do that, and I've been the only one who said it, is we must include it into the complete street guidelines. It's the same thing for intersections. We need it in the complete street guidelines. If we build it, build it correctly. The other thing is, obviously, I'm in support of accelerating the 10-year cycle plan. Thank you. I support bike lanes where they are appropriate, where it works for everyone. But I also, something different from the candidates here that I would like to implement is a bicycle licensing. Because we all share the road. It is uh, free of charge. Uh, it works in Thailand, it works in Tokyo, it works in so many other countries. Because the other day I was in the car and a professional cyclist did a U-turn right in front of us at Broadview and all the cars there panic. 
So we couldn't ho hold him accountable pe because he just took off. So I think the road is for everyone and everybody should respect it. And we need to identify individuals. So uh, I think bicycle licensing is not a big deal. You just, when you just go to the, you just get it, you, you get a sticker, you get a sticker and you get a number. And so we can track them and it's, uh, they can get insurance, they, there's a way to, uh, to prevent, uh, to increase safety on the road and cars to respect each other, cars and bikes, right? It's safety, it's safety. I'll just wait for them to finish. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm very proud that I worked on building the first commuter bike lane in the East End and that's the Dundas bike lane with Jack Layton when I was a school trustee and that have moved a motion that in 2019 there will be the complete street or corridor study for the Danforth with planning, with transportation and with economic development to make sure that all of the needs are met early in designing a complete street looking at cycling, pedestrians and automobile movement on the Danforth. I also have very, very strong commitment to intersections. Two people died this summer, both on bike lanes, one on the Danforth, uh, sorry, one on Bloor and one on Dundas, at intersections. Right turns on intersections are the most dangerous thing, bike lane or not bike lane, and the City of Toronto, we must deal with that. I'll just lastly quickly say for any downtown councillors, it's very hard because the majority of councillors on council, including the 25, hate bike lanes. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so I support the complete streets approach. I mean, the road is for is for everyone. It's for the bicyclists. It's for the pedestrians. It's for the transit users. It's the people in mobility devices. It's for people pushing baby strollers. It's for the car as well. Um, I think that we have to do a, a better job to make the bike lanes that we act have actually safer for people. Um, we, as, as Paula mentioned, we had some tra some tragedies of fatality on Dundas, which um, is brutal, and uh, we just have to have protection bike lanes for the for what we've got and, and we do need a network but again the street is for everybody and we need to make the street work for everybody and make it safer for everybody Thank you. Um, the final question of the night it's on the video screen if you'd like to take a look I see people like uh, getting the cars broken into. My car has been, been broken into a few times now, and people have tried to steal my car. I've had a bike stolen my off my porch. Been broken and into a it's few a good times neighborhood, now. but they're, they're people have tried to steal crime. my car. I've had okay. a bike stolen and what off do you do my with the porch. Call? It's a I good neighborhood, the but there is some petty okay. crime. Perfect. What will the candidates do to help reduce crime in the area? Chris Marinakis, you can start. One solution would be to start a neighborhood watch program like we used to have many years ago. That would be a start. Secondly, would be to involve the, the police and I would ask all, all people that are victims of crime to report it so the police are aware of the crimes in the area so they can up the attention to those areas. We have a really good relationship with uh, police in uh, 55 Division and we want to make sure that that is broadened out so that we have the community at the table with our police Crime has not been spiking, but it's definitely a piece that is affecting a lot of people in the East End. We want to make sure that the police, that the community are at the table, that they are working together to mitigate any, anything that is going wrong or anything that is making people feel uncomfortable so that we can have a safer, uh, a safer community really to address the the problem of petty theft what we see recently in the toronto danforth both sides of the danforth we're starting to see an influx really in car break-ins petty theft like uh, bike burglary what we really need is a neighborhood watch you can't have a police officer on every single corner watching out for petty crimes what we really need is the community working together with police and coordinating responses and looking out for suspicious activity we need to start with responding to the petty crimes. The frustrations that I hear most are you get, a pet, you get your bike stolen, 
unfortunately recently the the tire slashing you report it and nothing happens it didn't ha doesn't get solved until enough cases are are logged and and the frustrations are real we need either special constables or officers dedicated to answering these calls following up on these calls and really responding to the citizens who are getting their stuff stolen that's it thank you if, if your bike is registering get stolen it's easier to find it <laughs> i just put it out there uh yes we need more uh neighbor uh all neighbors neighborhood watch is uh, an idealistic concept because everybody is hardly hung they are working we are all work long hours we don't see what's happening so we need uh, to follow up, we need uh, constables, perhaps, like Dixon mentioned, uh, to help us locate the issue, locate the criminal, and find out more. Because uh, the other uh, two months ago, all the cars' uh, tires in my neighborhood got slashed. Uh, we contacted the police officer, and uh, they didn't follow up. They say, well, we don't know, and we don't have, we have better problems than this. So we need a system that addresses this very issues in our neighborhood and we need to take them seriously uh, thank you I think bringing communities together is one of the most important ways to address crime of any kind petty crime people knowing what's going on on the street something happens Facebook on different streets and eyes on the street uh, it's the most successful way being out on the street knowing what's going on, talking to your neighbors, getting together. I've had many safety walks when crime spikes in different neighborhoods over my time. And also I'm finding that many people have cameras. The latest uh, slashing of the tires, the fellow was caught because of the cameras that exist in the community and in different businesses. And uh, I think that's very successful in that way. I um, also just things are, it's very unfortunate that there aren't enough police walking through the neighborhoods and that uh, there just doesn't seem to be at times people feel they're not being listened to. But I think that keep going, I always encourage people keep calling, get logged, log what's going on and we will get to solve it. Yes, thanks. Um, so I've had the privilege to be on the Community Police Liaison Committee for 54 Division for the last eight years, and one of the things that we talk about at our monthly meetings is about people need to report crimes. They need to keep a log of what's going on. We've had numerous safety walks, numerous community safety meetings jointly with Paula, um, separately up in the northern sections of East York over these years, and, and the police, um, you know, they can't unfortunately be everywhere where we need them to be at all times, um, but um, you know that they can do targeted patrols when when it's requested from the community but they need to know that uh, that crime is um, is happening there and oftentimes we're told that people um, anecdotally talk about it and don't actually go and report it so you have to report it um, they need to have that in their statistics um, so that when they do these targeted patrols um, they know which areas and which neighborhoods that they have to uh, get to the number one to prevent crime is jobs and a good economy. And in this city, we have incredible wealth and we have incredible poverty. And it's that disparity that leads to this kind of crime. It's one of the richest cities in the world and 20% of people in our own ward are living in poverty. It's completely unacceptable. We have the capacity to create jobs in the city. We know that we do. We also have the ability to fix our budget and shift funds from ineffective programs into ones that work better, that give young people in particular uh, opportunities to be engaged in their community and to earn money and to be able to get educated and not have to resort to some of these things. Um, I think also that will help alleviate a lot of the gang recruitment that we've been seeing going on. Uh, last year, Toronto was rated the safest city in North America. We're probably not going to get that number this year. I don't think um, but that's not about petty crime it's been about the murder so I think that we're actually doing okay on a lot of these things and we mentioned complete streets earlier I think that's a big part of this people need to be feel like their streets are lively uh, that there's economic activity and cultural activity and the more people that are out in the streets the less crime there will be thank you to all the candidates we do have time for one question from the audience there was a lady there in the gray uh, come on, come on. <laughs>
in front of 10 neighbors. Um, so that, I think that should be some pilots, and I want to know what is the city going to do to, you know, that should be across the whole city. You should have mental health teams going out to, you know, when somebody calls and says, oh, someone's going crazy or someone's going to disturb, whatever, they need to have mental health people that are not caught. So the, the, the question was that um, there, what are you going to do about mental health and, and first responders and police? And I'll give each of you only 30 seconds to answer this question. Let's start with Mary. Thank you very much. I was part of the uh, implementation of the mobile crisis intervention team here with uh, 54 Division, 55 Division, and uh, the uh, Toronto Central Lynn. I actually went to the Toronto Central Lynn with my colleague uh, Janet Davis um, and with members of the community after the uh, Michael Elegon uh, episode uh, where he was shot in front of uh, people on, uh, on Milverton. It was a terrible tragedy, um, but we do need to have more of those rolled out across this city. I, obviously, first responders should all have that training, and I think police included. It's whoever shows up first is the one that deals with the situation, and then you bring in the, the experts, and so that's the case here. Treat, uh, police also need that training. In terms of mental health, the number one solution is always housing. Housing first, people that have a place to live, that have a home. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we need to ensure that people with mental health have support before any crime or anything like that should happen. Uh, we have to ensure that all social like that is available to all people to uh, that and um, that people sorry to identify these types of problems before something tragic happens I think you hit it on the nail we can't just have the police we can't just have the first responders being uh, having this on on their plate we need to make sure that we have public health people with them that we have mental health experts with them out on the ground floor to help in these situations we can't just leave this to the police to handle alone I do agree that Toronto Police Services should have training when it comes to mental health situations and when people are in mental health crises. Uh, recently with the Toronto Danforth shooting, I've had a family member who was shot and the Toronto uh, services, the mental health services especially, have been really, really top-notch following up. They have all sorts of translation services as well that help you and at the end of the day, that is what you really need. Mental health cannot be overlooked. I'm going to sound like a broken record. We, we definitely need our police to have the training to handle as first responders, bottom line, period. We can also invest further in our mental health services, increasing hours at our public health centers also. In addition, we need to bro uh, work with grassroots organizations and support their mental health initiative. Yes, we need to understand that recently the Premier cut $300 million from mental health. It's shame, shame, shame. We're sitting here talking about the things we would like to do. It's the provincial government that provides the mental health money. We have to push them for that in our community centres, in our health centres, and to assist the police when they're dealing with people that are in crisis. But it is just a travesty that that money has been cut because everything we want to do here today and everything we're speaking about will become very hard to do, if not impossible, with no dollars from the provincial government. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the candidates for their answers. Um, you've given us a lot to think about. Uh, we're going to move to closing statements. You'll each have one minute and I'll start with you, Ms. Landrick. I just want to thanks Centennial of course for hosting this thank you all for coming tonight um, there's been this this overarching just doom feeling that people aren't engaged that people don't care about our local democracy and you at home you here you're proving that our democracy really does matter um, for myself I'm running because I feel that in a way, this is the opportunity to make sure that local democracy matters, that we are taking ideas, molding ideas from our community to make sure that they're a part of what's going forward. I want to be a term limit uh, candidate, a person that gets in, does some good stuff, and then gets out of the way. I want to make sure that we are bringing more, that we're bringing more of more of the community to be a part of what's going on and thank you all for the candidates that are here tonight uh thanks guys again chris budo 
I would also like to thank everyone that came out tonight. It's a, it's a great audience, and I'm glad to see that people are involved uh, to this extent in local democracy. I do agree with Lanrick. We definitely do need to see term limits put into place. Personally, I, I believe in two term limits. And you can see, check out my platform online. I do talk about things such as the cost of living in the city of Toronto and how we can address that for young families to pensioners. And that's something that we didn't talk about today. Young families, it's really an unheard issue. You talk about daycares and their wait times and you talk about pensioners that can't afford medicine and groceries in the same week and we really have to be doing more. You have counselors that sit at this table who've been here for 15 years, 8 years and are talking about the exact same issues for way too long and are putting the same thing they've said 15 and 8 years ago forward and they haven't been doing nothing. You heard the counselor here talk about bike lanes and she has not had a single policy to move forward on bike lanes the last 15 or 8 years. You can choose any of them. I'd like to thank uh, Mary and Centennial College for hosting. I'd like to thank everybody else for, for being engaged and wanting to be an informed voter. Uh, just to add to those uh, points that my co candidates here mentioned, I am in support of two term limits. I'm also in support of ranked ballots. I'm also in, in support of increasing staff for a higher communication standard. That is the standard I live by at work and I, it will be the standard I live by as your counselor. So, so be an informed voter, vote for change. Thank you. Thank you everyone for being here today. Thank you for Centennial College for hosting us. Uh, thank you. Uh, if you have uh, any disagreements with me or you have any questions, I am always reachable. Please uh, contact me or meet with me. I can come and meet you when, whenever you need me to. My approach is simple. I have a community-based solutions approach. I will regularly meet with the community to discuss issues, find solutions, and implement it as effective as possible and as accurate as possible. Always engage with the community. I will offer an open door to all of those that I will represent. My electoral commitment will be built on engagement, communication, cooperation, and transparency. I am committed to my community to take action on the issues that are affecting all of us. Thank you for listening, listening and considering me. Uh, if you elect me, I will not let you down. And I also support ranked ballot. Thanks. Ms. Fletcher. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Marisol. Uh, I'll say that lobbyists don't have term limits, developers don't have term limits, <laughs> but councillors do have term limits and they're called elections. And that uh, people will make their minds up at the ballot box. Um, I am very committed to continue working with you and everyone throughout the new ward street by street and block by block to work on the issues that are important to you and represent you at City Hall. It's going to be four difficult years because we've seen that Doug Ford has started off in a certain way and I believe that he has more in store for the city. You'll remember though when he had a Ferris wheel, a monorail and a mega mall on the Portlands and working with Councillor Pam McConnell, we defeated that at City Hall and I'm committed to making sure his vision for Toronto, which is very bad, does not pass. I'm a strong voice in what will be turbulent times, and I'm hoping to go back and represent you at City Hall. Thank you, Ms. Fletcher. Ms. Fragadette. Thank you. Uh, sadly, the Doug Ford government changed the rules of this election after it started. And this is not the election that most of us up here originally signed up for. Um, democracy is at the heart of who we are here in Canada, and democracy to me is more than a vote every four years. It's an ongoing process of public consultation. It's about giving everyone a voice. And tonight I liked a lot of what I heard. Um, not everything, but a lot of it. Uh, in this room and all across this city, there are a lot of talented people and a lot of wonderful ideas. And how do we harness all of that to build the city of our dreams? How do we tackle tough challenges like affordability and climate change? We do not do it with Trump-style political hot air. Rather, we do it by working together and listening respectfully to one another. City Hall does not have all of the answers. Uh, we need to look at other cities and to the public for new ideas, and I understand that. And to me, leadership is listening hard in order to find the best possible solution and then working hard to get things done. And to learn more about my campaign, visit maryfragadakis.ca. Thanks again to everyone here. Thank you very much.
Ryan Lindsay. Yeah, there's lots of agreement at this table today, so I'd like to present myself as the candidate that's keenly focused on fiscal issues, finding the things that aren't working in the city budget, and there are hundreds of millions of dollars there each year, and shifting them to things that do work for us. I've mentioned my plan, Shift the Four Tax. It's a way to increase transit without raising a single dollar of tax, turning this 25 ward thing into an opportunity um, by reinvesting in our community councils and having more local representation. Uh, I'd like to fix the $1.5 billion deficit that we're headed towards, which is going to mean all kinds of cuts and tax raises, and we'd like to put that off, as well as um, I'd like to be able to win the battle of ideas. I mentioned Doug Ford always comes out swinging first with his terrible ideas. We need to beat him to the punch with our better ideas. We've heard all the good ideas here tonight. We've heard the talented people that are able to do it. Somebody has to go out there and get in front of the media and make it happen. Thank you, Ryan Lindsay. Chris Marinax. Thank you. I'd like to thank all the people that took the time to listen to us here today. Thank you. I'd also like to thank Story Art Center for hosting the, the event. We need to uh, have somebody to finally be accountable and to be the voice of Ward 14. I will be that voice for our community, for Toronto Danforth. I will use my experience, my knowledge, and my hard work to ensure that proper decisions are made down at City Hall. I'm a man of integrity and hard work, and I promise you that I will deliver on these promises. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Marinette. I'd like Hello. to allow uh, Alexander Pena, who's also on the ballot, to have him, um, some time. To Thank you very much, madam. My name is Alexander Pena, or Pena in Spanish. I'm sorry I couldn't be here because I wasn't invited. But um, I say, um, yeah, there is a, the city doesn't have the answer because the people is the one that has the answer. It's, uh, I want to regulate the rental apartment, rental unit by year of construction. It's not possible that a, a rental apartment may built in uh, before 1980, they're going to raise for $1,500. Every apartment and rental houses that had to be by year of construction, like before 1980, cannot be more than $950. Also, in, um, in uh, Queens and uh, um, Coswell, there is a public housing. They're kicking out the people there to build a condominium. Oh, que pasa? What's happening? The, is, is, is the land belong to the city? Why don't we put a, a public housing right there? Why are we going to put a condominium there? There is no chance for anybody here to buy an apartment because it's not for us, the apartments. The condominiums are not for us. It's for some other people, but nobody here in the whole Danford area can buy an apartment because it's not for us, right? So for who is the apartment? Who buy the condominiums? With, with they spreading like, like all, all the time, condominiums everywhere. But uh, people, they don't have a place to live. And then we have, a, we have a here, oh, what's the plan for the city for housing? Okay, people have to move in basement. Okay, let's tax the basement. No, it's not possible. The people have the answer. It's the moment the people stand up for this city. This city has, has having a dramatic change in the last eight years. Before eight years, it was a different city. Now we have a different city since eight years to here. Nobody can afford it. Food costs more. Transit costs more. Everything is more difficult. Why? The job is doing wrong. The job is wrong. It's the moment for the people to stand up. Ticanis. Ticanis. It's the moment for the people to stand up now for the city. Thank you. We Mr. love Penny. the city. We want a better city. We have to do talk. We have to we speak up. Speak up. We don't gonna we don't gonna listen people. We have to participate. We have to talk. Come on. From tomorrow Thank you. we gotta talk. Thank you. Thank you very much to everyone. That's all the time we have tonight. Thank you again, everyone, for coming. Before you go, I want to remind you to vote on October 22nd. Any Canadian citizen can vote if they're at least 18 years old and live in Toronto or own and rent property in the city. Polls open at 10 a.m. If you haven't received a voting card, head to a polling station with your identification showing your name and address. If you're not in town on October 22nd, advanced voting is from October 10th to 14th. Thanks again for joining us here at the Story Arts Center. For those of you watching online, 
That's it for tonight. For those of you here in person, we hope you'll make it and make time to speak with any students that you encounter as you leave the campus. Thank you to everyone. Well,